Day 43 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Well, today we are finishing the book of Exodus. Can you believe it? Another book in the Bible completed. And if you have been with us from the beginning of this year, or if you were part of the Heart Die family last year, or if you are loving what we are doing here, if you could please partner with us by just hitting that like button. That is your way of just giving back and saying, you know what? I believe in this. And I think that we need to get more people into the word of God, because this is where our faith is going to be strengthened. This is where we're going to grow our relationship with Christ. This is where we're going to be washed every Every single day through the living water. And if you have any questions at all, please make sure to check out the show notes or the description box below the video. I assure you that most questions about this particular Bible study can be found there, or you can always head to our website, heartdive.org. Otherwise, let's go ahead and pray and get into the word. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know that your will has already been written, Lord, but that doesn't give us an excuse not to still come to you in prayer and not to ask because your full desire is really just to know us. And knowing us means that you are speaking with us, that we are not only talking, but we are also listening for your voice. And so if we never ask the question, how will we ever hear the answers? So I thank you, Lord, for that revelation today. And I just pray, God, that we will fall in line with whatever that will is for our lives. Help us to see the steps. And we know that in order to see, there's got to be light. And so your light is going to be coming from your word. This is going to be the lamp into our feet and the light into our path. And so I pray that we embrace that today, every single word that you have spoken. May we never see it as something that is a waste of time or maybe that doesn't apply to our lives, but I pray that we will read with anticipation, knowing that you have got a message within every single word that you spoke. Even if we don't understand it right now, our faithfulness and our obedience to reading it all, Lord, I know you will reward that. I know it brings pleasure to your heart. It blesses you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll strengthen every person here today in both knowledge and wisdom, but most of all, in relationship to you. Thank you, Lord, for every person who is here. I pray that you'll meet their needs. God, you know what they are. I don't. So I just pray that you will hear every cry, hear every thought, hear every prayer that they speak. And I just pray that you will bring them an answer. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. And I ask that you please help us to also forgive others. Thank you, Lord, for giving us such a gift of grace and peace and joy every single day. Help us to understand where that source is, where we can go and get it when we don't feel like it, when we don't feel like we've got any joy left, when we don't feel like we have anything left to give, where we don't feel like we are worthy of your grace and mercy and kindness. And also, please don't lead us into temptation, Lord, but keep the enemy far from us. We want to be protected under the shadow of your wings. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Starting off here in chapter 39, and by the way, we are reading from the ESV by Christ. Crossway translation. From the blue and purple and scarlet yarns, they made finely woven garments for ministering in the holy place. They made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. So these priestly garments only made for the priests, which are right now Aaron and his sons. He made the ephod of gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. And they hammered out gold leaf and he cut into threads to work into the blue and purple and the scarlet yarns and into the fine twined linen in skill design. They made for the ephod attaching shoulder pieces joined to it at its two edges and the skillfully woven band on it was of one piece with it and made like it of gold, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold filigree and engraved like the engravings of a signet, according to the names of the sons of Israel. And he set them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod to be stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Because remember, the priests would basically carry the weight of the sin of the people, and he would take it into the holy of holies, the most holy place, to be able to atone for their sins once a year on the day of atonement. He made the breast piece in skilled work in the style of the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It was square 
They made the breast piece doubled, a span in its length, and a span its breadth when doubled. So remember, a span is the length from the thumb to the pinky finger. So that would have been about nine inches on a man's hand. And they set in it four rows of stones. A row of sardius, topaz, and carbuncle was the first row. And the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold filigree. They were 12 stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They were like signets, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes. So remember those pictures that I put into my Bible the other day and people were asking, where do you get those? Can you give them to us? All I do, people, is Google. That's all I do. And I just look for the ones that I like and then simply print them out. Right now, I am printing on tracing paper. Some people like to use vellum. Vellum is a little bit thicker, so that's why I choose tracing paper, and I just print it on my laser printer here at home, and it prints out just fine. I've used inkjet as well, but you just need to give it a little time to dry if you do use inkjet. So yeah, that's where I found these. I just Googled priestly garments, or I Googled breast piece exodus, and just click on images, and you can find the one you want, of course, making sure that it is from a reputable source. You don't want to be digging into a, a photo that comes from some wacky source. Verse 15, and they made on the breastpiece twisted chains like cords of pure gold, and they made two settings of gold filigree and two gold rings, and put the two rings of the two edges of the breastpiece. And they put the two cords of gold and the two rings at the edges of the breastpiece. They attached the two ends of the two cords to the two settings of filigree. Thus, they attached it in front to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. Then they made two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breastpiece on its inside edge next to the ephod. And they made two rings of gold and attach them in front to the lower parts of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod at its seam above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue so that it should lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod and that the breast piece should not come loose from the ephod as the Lord had commanded Moses. He also made the robe of the ephod woven all of blue. And the opening of the robe in it was like the opening in a garment with a binding around the opening so that it might not tear. On the hem of the robe, they made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. They also made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all around the hem of the robe, between the pomegranates, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, around the hem of the robe for ministering, as the Lord had commanded Moses. So notice how many times it says, as the Lord commanded Moses. That is the most important detail that we are getting from this, is the fact that Moses had been commanded by God to carry these things out detail by detail. And the fact that God is repeating exactly what they did according to exactly what he had spoken, then that tells us that they obeyed. They did everything that they were supposed to do. And we should never look at this and be like, okay, I am so over this because that takes on the attitude that God's words don't matter. They also made the coats woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons and the turban of fine linen and the caps of fine linen and the linen undergarments of fine twined linen and the sash of fine twine linen and of blue and purple and scarlet yarns embroidered with needlework as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. Now, one of the most fascinating things to me is that all of these items that are being declared holy to the Lord are built out of materials that mostly belonged to the Egyptians at one point. I mean, these were items that were used in pagan practices of worship, and I love it because it shows us that God can use and redeem anything for His purpose. And sometimes we can bury ourselves so deep in the idea of holiness that we will separate ourselves by putting up walls of self-righteousness, and we will start declaring everything else as evil, or we will throw stones of judgment, even shutting the door to certain people as we look at them with disgust. Can you imagine if Jesus did that to us when we were living the way we once were? Can you imagine if He deemed us unusable whenever we were lost? And this is a tough one because just as the Israelites are called to be set apart, so are we. But we need to understand that holiness, that set-apartness, doesn't mean that we are somehow better or more loved than those who are not saved. You see, holiness should make us more loving and more kind. We should be the ones who are treating people better than the world does. Yet you don't see that. You will often see that it is the Christians making fun, spewing hate, and declaring judgment on people. 
So heart check. Are you able to see the potential of redemption in people and things that are currently unholy to the Lord? Verse 32, thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases, the covering of tanned ram skins and goat skins and the veil of the screen, the ark of the testimony with its poles and the mercy seat, the table with all its utensils and the bread of the presence, the lampstand of pure gold and its lamps with the lamps set and all its utensils, and the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, and the screen for the entrance of the tent, the bronze altar and its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs, and all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle, for the tent of meeting." the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the people of Israel had done all the work. And Moses saw all the work. So this word saw here actually means that he was inspecting the work. He was giving it its final stamp of approval. And behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. So had they done it. Then Moses blessed them. So he does so, he puts that stamp on there saying, well done, y'all did it, good job, it's all complete, and it is all ready to go. So once again, we complete a chapter full of intricate details that seem as though they may not have any sort of practical application for us today. But whenever you read through the Father's eyes, you will begin to see that everything He does is by design. You see, the creation of the universe and everything in it, the complexity of the human mind and our bodies, or the uniqueness of the earth, and yet He still knows the hairs on our head? He knows our name out of billions of people? He knows every single tear that falls, and just as every thread that went into the garments mattered, so does every waking moment, every breath you take, and sometimes we want to skip over these parts or maybe even skip over the entire Old Testament because of boring reads like this one. I mean, I'm not declaring this boring, but I've heard it said, and usually it's because we're so focused on the end goal that we miss the details or we get discouraged. But he repeats the details over and over for a purpose. It's so that the builders wouldn't miss a single step. So heart check. Can you see God in the small details of his word? Or are you only wanting to skip ahead to the good stuff? And I'm not judging anybody. I have been there. I many years I would read through this stuff and actually maybe not even read it. I would see we're there and I'd be like, okay, next, turn the page. When do we get to something better and more juicy? Chapter 40. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, on the first day of the first month, you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. So this first month is the month of Abib or Nisan. So it's been one year since the Israelites left Egypt. And so much significance is encased in this one year of following and trusting God. You see, when they left Egypt, it was exciting. It was like getting a new car and going on a new journey. But once that new car smell went away and the roadblocks hit, They didn't want to go any further. Imagine if Moses would have let them turn back whenever they were throwing their temper tantrums, thinking that Egypt and slavery was much better than where they're at now. They would have been stuck whenever God wanted to move them forward into His promise. And this happens with so many Christians. Our first experience with God is as far as we will ever get, because once life gets hard or we go through a dry spell— we fall off and we go back to what we were once doing. And we sort of live in this perpetual one-year journey with Him because we're constantly looking for that initial excitement again that we once had, and then we never grow past it. So we can be a Christian for 30, 40, 50 years, but only have a toddler spiritual maturity. So heart check. How's your walk progressing? Have you pressed beyond the initial one-year excitement? Or are you perpetually seeking that initial encounter? 
Verse three, and you shall put in it the Ark of the Testimony. So remember, the Ark of the Testimony is where the Ten Commandments will be. It is in the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And so it is the representation of God's presence among his people. And you shall screen the Ark with the veil. So the veil is going to be the thing that separates the most holy place from the holy place that only the high priest can pass through. It not only serves as a separation, but also a bit of protection, I believe, so that no one goes beyond that veil and stepping into the glory of God lest they die. And you shall bring in the table. So the table would be where the showbread is. Remember those two stacks of six on each side and arrange it and you shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. So the table for us today, we can look at that as our communion with the Lord or feasting on the word. And then the lampstand, of course, being the light of Christ in us. And you shall put the golden altar for incense before the ark of the testimony. So the golden altar representing prayer prayer and set up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. So the burnt offering, the altar would be symbolic of Jesus's sacrifice and place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. So the basin for us symbolizes the washing of the word, purification, and the fact that we are washed clean. And you shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen for the gate of the court. So the court again offers protection and the gate is the way through which we are able to enter into the holy place, which of course the door is Jesus. Now what's really interesting here is if we look at the place of all of these items. So outside in the court, you would have the altar followed by the wash basin. And then here would be the door through which they would enter. You would have the lampstand over here, the table over here, and the altar of incense right before the ark, which is right here, the veil. So this is the holy of holies, most holy place. This is the holy place within the tabernacle. But you can't help but notice how these things are placed. And perhaps this was a foreshadowing to the cross by which Jesus would come and die as the perfect sacrifice. And if you're wondering where I got these pictures, again, something I printed out, cut out, glued in. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it may become holy or set apart. So the anointing oil would be sanctification. And the oil itself, of course, is not magic. I mean, you don't put oil and then suddenly it's amazing, right? It's just a defining mark. It's the thing that marks us. Our anointing will also mark us as set apart. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become holy, most holy. You shall also anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water and put on Aaron the holy garments. So here the utensils are used for preparation and maintenance. Holy garments, of course, symbolizing righteousness, safety, parts of it were for safety, remembering the tribes or to pray, decision-making, consecration, atonement, covering of humanity, service, modesty, divinity, heavenliness. Of course, this is from the gold, the blue, the royalty would be purple, redemption being the scarlet, and humanity being represented by linen. And you shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as priest. So this anointing would mark the permanence into the priesthood for generations to come. You shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priest. And their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. This Moses did according to all that the Lord had spoken or commanded him. So he did. So notice how it keeps repeating. So he did. That repetition means precise obedience. Like he did it. Oh, yes, he did do it. And this is so important because Israel's welfare depended on the obedience of not only the people, but especially the leaders. Verse 17, in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle. And I just thought to myself, how did he get it up there? I guess it was, I don't know, did they have ladders back then? And put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil and arranged the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put in place the screen for the door of the tabernacle and he set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put the water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they were into the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. So they did it. They listened, they obeyed, they did the work and they completed it. And there's so much power in the words, finished the work. I mean, if it weren't for the finishing work of Moses, he may have never received the accolade in Hebrews as being faithful in all that he did. And the Bible is full of faithful servants of God who finished the work. I mean, you had Noah who built the ark, you got Nehemiah who built the wall, Paul finished the race. But of course, most importantly, Jesus finished the work of redemption on the cross. And we all start out with good intentions. We all want to finish the work. In fact, we have come here with the intention to finish the Bible in a year, but it's not the reading of every word and checking off of every box that will deem the work finished. Because remember, the real work is in the details. It's in the blood and the sweat and the tears that are poured out in the process. The real work happens in the middle, which is right where we are today. We don't finish the work until we take our last breath and the Lord says, well done, my good and faithful servant. But the question is, are we going to hear that? I think that's everyone's questions whenever they become a believer, like, am I doing the right thing? Will we truly finish the work? How do we know what that work is? So heart check, what has God called you to do in the middle? That's the first question to ask. And it could be something so simple. So if you are truly asking the question, what am I supposed to do? Let's give you more practical steps here. Ask him daily, every single day, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Make a list, prioritize the things that are necessary to take care of today. You can reflect on it weekly, whether you take a Sabbath day or not, slowing down physically, making sure you're resting, tuning in spiritually, making sure you're refreshing yourself mentally. You can seek specific vision. Yes, you can ask specific. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. So Moses fasted and he prayed, he met with God and he followed the plan. And that is the most important part. When he heard heard God say, build a wash basin, he made sure that that wash basin was constructed. It's those little details that we think, I don't know if that's so spiritual or not, where God is like, do it, and then you will see. And a reminder again of the importance of the tabernacle. This is the Hebrew word mishkan. This would have represented God's dwelling on earth. Later on, we will see the building of the temple. And of course, after Jesus died, a building will no longer be needed because we will become the place that the spirit dwells within. We are the building. We are the temple. We are the church, the body of Christ. Verse 34, then the cloud. So this cloud here will be what is known as an epiphany, which is the dramatic descent that manifests God's glory or his Shekinah glory. So the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now notice that the glory didn't fill the tabernacle until the work was finished. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. So it sort of acted like one of those gates. You know, if the gate goes up, you guys can move out. The gate comes back down, you don't move. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So I love that we get to end this book of dramatic events with the beautiful glory of God. 
God hovering over his people, protecting them, ready to guide them, letting them know that he wants an intimate relationship with them. They didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit like we do. So this is their way of knowing that God's presence was with them. They could simply look at the tabernacle and see his splendor and his power right there. So heart check, what is your cloud? How do you know that the presence of God is with you? And let's take it a little bit deeper through our deep dive questions. What does holy to the Lord mean to you? How can we apply this to our lives as a royal priesthood? How significant is completion in the Bible, particularly as it relates to salvation? Does God's desire for excellence and strict obedience still hold up in church today? Are there still standards that we should be meeting in worship? And how can we apply these concepts to our own work outside of church and worship? What still requires anointing and consecration in today's worship? So Heavenly Father, we thank you for the finishing work of the greatest work of all on the cross. If it weren't for you, Jesus, we would all be stuck somewhere in constant spiritual survival mode while living in bondage to our sin. So we're so grateful for the freedom that we have today to worship with abandon. But we also see your heart and standard of excellence and beauty. I pray that we don't water that down and may we still bring our best when you call us into service. Help us to see the details and the role that we play to carry them out. If there's anything that we're not offering with a grateful heart that could be of use for the building of your kingdom, will you show us, Lord? Help us to see the need and to rise to meet it where we have the ability to do so. I pray that you will continue to grow us in our prayer life, for we truly desire to have an intimate relationship with you. And as with any relationship, that requires communication. So I pray that our words will be a sweet fragrance to you. Thank you, Jesus, for being the perfect sacrifice. And I pray that you will show us how we are able to live out our lives as a living sacrifice as unto you. We know that we are anointed by your Holy Spirit so that we can be a people who are set apart. But that doesn't mean we're above anyone. If we're gonna model our lives after you, Jesus, this means we are here to serve others. So help us understand that. Our job is to love and to leave the judgment to you. Thank you for giving us a greater understanding of your word where we may have never understood it before. I pray that we will never glance over the importance of the foundation that you have set in the Old Testament. Give us a hunger and a thirst for it, Lord. I pray that we will read every single word with joy, with anticipation and expectation of what you are about to speak to us as individuals. Help us to be diligent in all that we do, but especially in seeking you, for we know that you reward those who diligently seek you. And no, we don't live for the reward, but we would be lying if we said we could care less about it. May we never deny a good gift that you so desire to give to us. And I pray that through our faithfulness that we will indeed be able to hear you say one day, well done, my good and faithful servant. So help us today to see what steps we need to take to finish the work. We love you so much. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die, but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, 
Thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.